does this seem like justice to you? Does this seem fair to you? The nine staffers from Stephen Colbert's show who were arrested for being unaccompanied in the Capitol. This happened on June 16th. The charges have been dropped against them. They were originally charged with obstructing an official proceeding because they were in the Capitol building and they weren't supposed to be there. They got kicked out once and then they returned. They were harassing the the offices, at least. I guess the Republican lawmakers who they were attempting to harass weren't actually in their offices, but they banged on the windows of Lauren Boebert's office and uh, Kevin McCarthy's office and Jim Jordan's office. And they were arrested and the charges were dropped. And this is the justification. This is this is so bananas to me because this is the justification from the U.S. attorney in the District of Columbia for why he's dropping the charges instead of prosecuting this. This is what he said. He said, after a comprehensive review of all the evidence and the relevant legal authority, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia has determined that it cannot move forward with misdemeanor charges of unlawful entry against the nine individuals who were arrested on June 16th of 2022 at the Longworth Office Building. The individuals who entered the building on two separate occasions were invited by congressional staffers to enter the building in each instance and were never asked to leave by the staffers who invited them, though members of the group had been told at several points, at various points by the U.S. Capitol Police that they were supposed to have an escort. The office would be required to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that these invited guests were guilty of the crime of unlawful entry because their escort chose to leave them unattended. We do not believe that it is probable that the office would be able to obtain and sustain convictions on these charges. The defendants no longer will be required to appear for a scheduled hearing in the Superior Court of the District of Columbia on July 20th, 2022. Okay, so even though th- th- this reminds me actually of what James Comey did to Hillary Clinton in 2016, where he wrote this indictment of Hillary Clinton, how she mishandled classified information, how she deliberately set up her own email server in a closet in her home, knowing that this was not only dangerous and a threat to national security, but against the law. He wrote this damning indictment of her. And then at the end, he goes, but we're not going to prosecute because, well, you know, it might be kind of difficult and we don't want to, and it might look political. And it was just the most mind-blowing conclusion to an indictment. It was like saying, look at the puzzle that I've built. One plus one plus one plus one plus one equals, and you sit there expecting it to be five because it's very obvious. And then they go, 10, because we choose it for it to be 10. This is the same exact thing. They were in the Capitol on two separate occasions on the same day, unaccompanied. They were aware that they were supposed to have an escort and they didn't. And that should be enough to prosecute them. And they should be prosecuted because that is what happened to conservatives who did the exact same thing. Here's the thing. Stephen Colbert is a liberal. Stephen Colbert is not some neutral television personality with no political agenda, no political leanings, and who engages in no political activism. The nine staffers for Stephen Colbert are are not simply um, random, neutral actors with, with no ulterior motives. They are leftists. They have a political agenda. And their political agenda, of course, matches the political agenda of the Biden administration. Their political agenda is a leftist agenda. And that is why the U.S. Uh, attorney for the District of Columbia is not prosecuting them because they are liberal. This is, this is a double standard, but it's worse than a double standard. It shows us that what we are facing right now in the United States is actually a system where there are two tiers of justice. And I suppose I should even put justice in quotation marks here because if you are conservative, then you can be thrown in prison for over a year before you even stand trial for entering a so-called restricted area, even if your crime was nonviolent, But if you're liberal and you do literally the exact same thing, if you enter a restricted area without an escort, knowing that you're supposed to have an escort, you're just let off scot-free. This is banana republic type of stuff. This is not an isolated incident. This This is a really big deal. If you compare the January 6th defendants, the nonviolent January 6th defendants, let's be specific, to Stephen Colbert's nine, what's the difference between how these cases are being treated under the law? There is one difference. The difference is politics. The difference is that the January 6th defendants were Trump supporters who were against Joe Biden, who had concerns about election integrity, and Stephen Colbert's nine were in these congressional office buildings to harass Republican lawmakers, to harass, the to, to attend the January 6th committee on behalf of the leftist that they work for, Stephen Colbert. 
And because of that, they were let off scot-free. This, my friends, this is an abuse of power. This is beyond a double standard. This is, this is beyond political targeting. In fact, let's dig in into this U.S. attorney. Who is this U.S. attorney who dropped the charges? Why did he drop the charges? What is his ideology? What is he doing now, not just to these, these nine staffers from the Stephen Colbert show, but what is he doing now to January 6th defendants who are charged with exactly the same thing, being in a restricted area in the Capitol when they shouldn't be? That's what I want to talk about today. I'm Liz Wheeler. This is The Liz Wheeler Show. Now, first of all, I like Dormeo because really good, really nice mattresses are crazy expensive, but I still want to sleep on a bed that feels really good and really nice. At a fraction of the cost of a new mattress, you can get that new bed feeling without having to buy a new bed. Their smart body zoning helps create better support for your body while you sleep, which means no more waking up with unexpected aches and pains that you didn't have the night before. Their mattress topper has a full range of sizes to fit your needs from twin all the way through king. They even have an RV size and a new split head king. And it's perfect for everything from an adjustable base to a spare bed in the guest room to couches, futons, even boats. Basically, if you can sleep on it, they probably have a mattress topper for it. Plus, Dormeo is known for their incredible customer service. Don't believe me? Give them a call. Message them on their website and be amazed at how fast they respond. Let me tell you, they sent me one of these and I love it. I think you will too. Right now, if you go to my URL, it's dormeo.com slash Liz, you'll receive 30% off your Dormeo mattress topper. It's the best offer you'll find anywhere, but you have to go to dormeo.com slash Liz. Remember, with their 10-year warranty and a 100-night risk-free trial plus free shipping, it's crazy not to give Dormeo a try. dormeo.com slash Liz. Okay, so let's zoom out for a moment here. Let's look at big picture here. Let's look at the Department of Justice and how they are addressing um, various infractions that people have committed in the last two years. And specifically, I want to compare January 6th of uh, 2021 with June 16th of 2022. We all know what happened on January 6th. There was peaceful protests outside the White House. President Trump hosted a rally and then people marched at the Capitol. The vast majority of people were peaceful. There were some people who became violent, who started rioting. Um, There were about 850 people who are now facing charges um, for for breaking laws on January 6th. Most of whom, by the way, are facing charges uh, of of nonviolent offenses. And then we have uh, we have June sixteenth of twenty twenty two, where these nine these nine team members that came from Stephen Colbert's show um, a- a- entered entered the Capitol. Now they entered the Capitol with permission, and, and I want to focus on June sixteenth first. I want to go through the facts of exactly what happened, so that we can we can see if uh, the treatment from the Department of Justice is, is is equal, if it's fair, if it is actually just. So on June 16th, these nine team members from Stephen Colbert's show went to the Capitol building and they attempted to gain access to the room in the Capitol where the January 6th committee was holding their hearing. Now, in order to enter this room, um, you have to have press credentials or you have to be a guest of one of the Congress, one of the members of Congress. And they applied for press credentials, but they were denied because they were deemed an entertainment venue, which of course is what they are. They are, they're not a news organization. They're not, you know, cable news channel or print news. They, they are entertainment. So they were denied, they were denied press credentials. Now, what did they do? Did they say, okay, well, we were denied credentials. We know this is a restricted area. We're not allowed in here unless we, you know, have permission and show our, show our pass. No, 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 no. What they did is they entered anyway. They, 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 they violated the, the rule. In fact, it was, it was beyond a rule. It's a law. They violated the law and they went in, they went into this room anyway. And I can, I can say the word illegal. I can say the word unlawful. We know that this is not just, um, corporate policy. This is not just the building rules. This is actually a law. Um, and the Capitol police are, are there at the Capitol to enforce these laws in order to protect members of Congress or, at least the Capitol Police is supposed to be there if they aren't if they aren't called off. Um, but you know, let's 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 not get to January sixth yet. We're focusing on June sixteenth for a second. Um, so this team, the Stephen Colbert team, went into this this January sixth committee hearing room without press credentials after they were denied their application, and the Capitol Police addressed their presence in the room because they weren't allowed to be here. This is what Fox News reported at the time. They said. Quote, when Capitol Police spotted members of Colbert's team at the January 6th committee area, they were schooled away and left the House office building. Okay, so 
First of all, they knew they weren't allowed to be there and they deliberately entered a restricted area. Put a pin in that word restricted because we'll be back to that phrase restricted area. It's it, it's kind of key to what a lot of the January 6th defendants are, are facing right now. Um, also worth noting, while, while we're talking about this first entry, this first unlawful entry of this Colbert 9, um, Colbert's insurrectionists is what I like to call them, the... The fact that they got into this area, this January 6th committee hearing area without credential, credentials, the fact that they, they, they breached this restricted area means that these nine, these nine people, these Colbert's insurrectionists were actually closer to members of Congress than anyone on January 6th was to a member of Congress, despite, you know, AO, AOC's Instagram lives detailing, you know, trauma. And, you know, she said she was almost raped and almost killed despite her lies about what happened. Uh, the Colbert Nine actually gained closer access to members of Congress illegally than anyone on January 6th did. So just, just so we're clear on that. So once, once the Capitol Police kicked Colbert's team out of the January 6th committee hearing area, they actually entered another, another building, the Longworth building. Now, when they, both times that they gained entry, they, they did not, they did not breach doors. They did not break windows. They were, they were allowed in because they were given access. Who gave them access? Great question. They were given access by the staff of Democratic members of Congress, including, by the way, January 6th committee member Adam Schiff. Adam Schiff's staff members helped Colbert's team gain access, even though they weren't allowed to have access. Now, Colbert's team was told that in order to be in the congressional office buildings, you have to have an escort with you at all times. And it's your responsibility to make sure that you have an escort. Otherwise, your, your presence in this building, regardless of whether you broke a window or breached a door, your presence here without an escort is, is unlawful. You would be deemed um, in a restricted area where you're not allowed to be. Again, put a pin on that word, restricted area. Um, it's it's my favorite phrase of this uh, of this entire of this entire episode. So what did these what did these staff members of Colbert do? What did they, what did these nine people do while they were in the Longworth building? Well, they went to the offices of Kevin McCarthy, the minority leader in the House. They went to the office of Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan, and they went to Congresswoman Lauren Boebert's office. And what did they do at at the offices of these Republican members of Congress. They pounded on the windows. They pounded on the doors. Fortunately, the Republican members of Congress weren't there. They weren't present in their offices. But the, the attempt to hound these members of Congress, including pounding on their windows and pounding on the door, um, that's that's what they were there for. That's what the Colbert Nine, that's the behavior the Colbert Nine engaged in. Around this time, um, the, the escort of, of these people disappeared. They left. They they left. The escort left the um, staff members of Stephen Colbert unattended in the office building, which rendered the, their presence, the Colbert Nine's presence, unlawful. They were now in a restricted area, and they had been told that you must have an escort with you at all time. And they ignored this. They they didn't care about the law. They disregarded these these this guidance intended to keep members of Congress safe. And they stayed there, and they began to film skits skits that involved. Um, attempting to harass Republican members of Congress, who again, fortunately, were not present, but the intent to harass them was was there, and 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 certainly they acted out on it by pounding on windows and doors. So it was at that point, at about eight thirty at night, that these nine people were arrested by Capitol Police, and this was this was about a month ago. This was a little bit over a month ago, a month and just a couple days ago. And in that amount of time, about four to five weeks, that's how long it took for the charges against these individuals who were in a restricted area in Congress where they weren't supposed to be for the charges to be completely dropped. They were only held in jail overnight. They weren't thrown in the DC gulag. They weren't put in solitary confinement. They weren't held for well over a year, deprived of their due process rights. None of that. They were let go the next day, told to show up in a month for, for, um, to be charged officially for their trial. And before that happened, the U.S. Attorney's Office dropped the charges. So that's what happened on, on June 16th. Now let's, let's rewind about a year and a half to January 6th. What happened on January 6th? Well, obviously, President Trump held the rally outside the White House. There were a lot of people in um, Washington, D.C., who were concerned about election integrity, given the fact that Democrats had done so much electioneering leading up to the election. And um, a lot of these peaceful protesters walked down to the Capitol after President Trump's rally. The vast, vast majority of them were peaceful. Um, some of them, some of them entered the Capitol building. Now, they weren't supposed to do this. There was a perimeter around the Capitol. There were barriers that were blocking the Capitol 
Ordinarily, you are allowed to go near the Capitol or uh, in the Capitol even, but on that day, you were not allowed to do that. And the barriers noted that this was a restricted area and you weren't allowed. Now, here's the thing. Some of the barriers, as we have seen from, from the videos, had been moved. Some of the barriers had been, um, had been removed to allow entry. Now, the people that removed the barriers, um, whether they were feds or whether they were not feds is the topic for an episode we already did on, on Ray Apps. So if you want to go and look at the facts of that, highly recommend you go watch that episode. But the point of this is that the people that moved the barriers created a situation where unless you were right there when the barriers were moved, perhaps you didn't know that you weren't allowed to walk through this, this gate in the fence. Um, you didn't know that you were entering a restricted area. And so a lot of these people uh, sort of unwittingly walked into a restricted area and um, were then were then then entered the Capitol because the door was open to them. The Capitol police actually opened the door to allow some of these protesters in. So again, this is this is um this is entering the Capitol, but it wasn't as though it wasn't as though these protesters removed the fence themselves, all of them, or that they all broke windows or breached doors. A lot of them just walked peacefully in as if they were invited. They were let in the Capitol in a way similar to how the Colbert Nine were let in, that a staff member opened, a Democratic Congress member's staff opened the door for them. Similarly, the Capitol Police opened the door for them. And um, many of the January 6th protesters, even the ones who were in the Capitol, even though it was a restricted area, many of them, most of them were very peaceful. They, they yes, made a spectacle of themselves, sure, no argument there. Um, but they peacefully protested. They did not commit violence. A few committed violence, and I'm obviously not talking about them, but the vast majority of them were, were very peaceful. And what happened to them? Well, within 72 hours, perhaps because of uh, geo-tracking, um, the FBI began to arrest arrest these folks after they had left the Capitol. They arrested them all around the country. And the majority of whom, um, when they were arrested and charged, they were, they were held in prison in solitary confinement in, in basically the gulag of Washington, D.C. for a year. It is, that was January 6th of 2021. We are now at, we are now in the middle of July, 2022, and many of them are still being held in, in prison. We are only now beginning to see trials happen for, for these individuals, that their due process is actually, um, I don't even want to say being respected because it's not. You can't respect due process if someone's being held in solitary confinement for a year for a nonviolent crime. Um, the Department of Justice, Biden's Department of Justice, has charged 850 individuals from January 6th. But here's the thing. 240 of those who were charged were charged with obstruction of an official proceeding. Now, you might remember one of the most famous pictures from January 6th was of this uh, guy named Jacob Chansley. He's uh, what's known as the QAnon shaman, um, the guy with the, with the horns, um, who, uh, was, I don't know, he made a spectacle of himself. He looked like an idiot. And he wasn't even, by the way, some mega Republican. He was some kind of environmentalist who lived in his parents' basement, uh, off his rocker. This guy was held in solitary f- confinement for a year for making that spectacle. And the charge was obstruction of an official proceeding. It wasn't even, uh, a violent offense that was committed. And now Jacob Chansley himself, this is getting a little tangential, but also not tangential, so follow along with me. Um, he was coerced to plead guilty to this obstruction charge just by nature of the abuse that was inflicted on him um, by being held in solitary confinement for a year. So regardless of the outcome of, of his prison sentence, and he was sentenced to, to many, many months, uh, years, in fact, in prison for this, um, it can't be a just sentence. It can't be justice served because of the solitary confinement that he was subjected to and because his his so-called confession or his pleading was was coerced here. So these these are it's 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 important for us to understand the facts of what happened on June 16th, 2022 and what happened on January 6th or June 16th and what happened on January 6th of 2021 because if we are to analyze um <laughs> this gross double standard that is being applied by the Biden Department of Justice, if we are to fully comprehend that we are living in a in a country where double standards are not just double standards, it is actually a two-tier system where if you are a Christian or you are a conservative or you dared to be a Trump supporter or you are concerned about election integrity, then you will be charged 
and targeted by the top law enforcement agency in our land on the basis of your religious and political beliefs. But if you're a liberal and you commit the same acts as a conservative, you engage in a nonviolent infraction entering restricted areas of the Capitol where you know you're not supposed to be, you're kicked out and then you enter again, you're let go scot-free. Why? The only difference here, the only difference is politics. The only difference is the politics of the people in charge and the politics of the people who are being targeted. And that brings us to the politics of the people who are who are levying the charges, the politics of the people who are actually doing doing the the political targeting. I'm not just talking about the Biden administration in this general vague way. I'm not just talking about the Biden administration, Department of Justice even. I'm talking about the actual individual whose office is in charge of these decisions. Now, I like ExpressVPN because it keeps my family and our information safe when we're online. If you go online without ExpressVPN, well, using the internet without ExpressVPN is like going to the bathroom without closing the door you want to keep your business private. Likewise, when you go online without a VPN, internet service providers can see every single website you visit. They can then legally sell your information without your consent to ad companies and tech giants who then use your data to target you. When you use ExpressVPN, internet service providers cannot see your online activity. You are protected. Your identity is anonymized by a secure VPN server. Your data is also encrypted for maximum protection. It's also very, very easy to use, very user-friendly. You just fire up the app, you click one button, and it works on all your devices, on your phone, on your laptop, even your router, so everyone who shares your Wi-Fi can be protected. I personally like ExpressVPN because it keeps my family and our personal information safe when we are online, and we're online a lot. So secure your online activity today by visiting expressvpn.com slash Liz. If you use my... URL, E-X-P-R-E-S-S, VPN.com slash Liz, then you can get an extra three months for free. ExpressVPN.com slash Liz. Okay, so the difference in um, the difference in the treatment of these of these two individual groups, the January 6th defendants and the June 16th defendants are politics. The difference in the politics of the people being charged and the politics of the person doing the charges, charging. And that brings us to the U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia. You can see his picture on the screen right now. His name is Matthew Graves. Matthew Graves, his office is the one that made the decision to drop the charges against Stephen Colbert's nine insurrectionists. And um, this individual, (laughs) this individual is not only applying justice in an unfair way, this individual has demonstrated that he is willing to use the power of the federal government to target his political enemies. And this actually has nothing to do for a second with Stephen Colbert. Yes, Stephen Colbert's staffers should be charged if January 6th defendants are going to be charged. But if we put aside the Colbert nine, the the nine insurrectionists for just a second, Matthew Graves has attempted to elevate the charges against the January 6th defendants Um, above simply obstruction of an official proceeding. He's attempted to elevate that nonviolent crime all the way to a domestic terror charge. Stephen Colbert's nine were let off scot-free. The charges were dropped. The January 6th defendants for a nonviolent crime that's, that's very similar, if not exactly the same, to what Stephen Colbert's staff did are now facing convictions on terror charges. And, and I, I want to read you exactly what, um, what this office, the Office of Matthew Graves, writes in this, this sentencing document in just a second. But I, I want to talk, too, about the personal politics of Matthew Graves. Because the personal politics, uh, I mean, he, 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 his family is very radical left. Who, who is the wife of Matthew Graves? The wife of Matthew Graves is a woman named Fatima Goss Graves, who recently testified in front of Congress in favor of abortion. Chairman Maloney, Ranking Member Comer, and members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to testify today. My name is Fatima Goss-Graves, and I'm president and CEO at the National Women's Law Center. And I'm here today because in a single day, millions lost a right, and a right they had for nearly 50 years, 
that had been fundamental to our health and our life and our future and to this society. The decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization has already proven to be catastrophic. Within two weeks, 14 states were already without abortion care, now more. And people are now told they will be forced to stay pregnant, they will be forced to give birth, and they even are now being told they cannot leave their state. And we got here in a dizzying fashion. Now, she actually, Fatima Goss Graves actually goes on and on talking about abortion, advocating for abortion on demand, unrestricted, making grotesque arguments in favor for abortion, um, such as, you know, w w women need abortion to be financially stable. It it's advantageous for your career to have an abortion. Just really grotesque arguments that, that um, if you boil it down to the heart of the matter, are, are advocating for women to sacrifice the soul of another person for material gain. Because that, that's what happens if, if you say, oh, well, for my career's advancement's sake, I had to abort my child. You're really sacrificing a soul for material advancement. That's what this woman is advocating for. This is the, this is the opinion of a very, this is a very extreme opinion. This is an opinion that is far removed from mainstream American thought on abortion. This is, this is the opinion of a very radical leftist, a radical leftist who has no regard for human dignity, for human life, and for human rights. And this woman is married to U.S. Attorney Matthew Graves. Um, the background and the politics of the individuals who are supposed to be neutral arbiters of justice in our nation, we, ca we can't ignore that. We can't ignore the fact that, um, that this is a radical leftist who is, letting, who, who is letting people who share his own political views, like Stephen Colbert's nine insurrectionists, go scot-free because he shares their political agenda and he's targeting January 6th defendants with, with elevated charges that are outrageous, that have never been a charge like this. We have never seen a charge like this levied against anyone of any political persuasion based on, um, based on an obstruction charge. There's never been a prosecutor in the entire United States who has tried to charge an individual who was, who was peacefully protesting and broke a law by obstructing a, an official proceeding, but doing it in a nonviolent way with domestic terrorism. We have never, ever seen this before. But it's not a coincidence that, that a man that would do that, that would wield the power of the federal government to target people who are counter to his political opinions would be married to a woman who has no regard for human life, for human dignity, and for human rights. What, what Matthew Graves is doing right now is he wants this obstruction charge um, uh, he wants these obstruction charges treated like terrorism. And I want to give a very concrete example here. So there, there was a guy on January 6th by the name of Guy Wesley uh, Reffitt. And Guy Wesley Reffitt is not a really good dude. He's, 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 not, a, he's not a dude that I, um, that, that, that I want to defend. <laughs> it's not a guy that, whose behavior is exemplary in any way. And, um, but that's the thing. That's the thing. It doesn't matter whether, whether when you're talking about whether justice is just, when you're talking whether when you're talking about whether justice is being applied equally, it doesn't matter whether you like the individual or whether you think that their action was a wise or good action or whether it was a stupid and bad action. What matters is whether they are being treated equally under the law. And so for the purposes of this discussion, that's what I'm talking about in in relation to Guy Wesley um, Reffitt. So he he was there on January 6th and he's been held for a year in prison in Washington D.C. before his trial. Um, he was held from February of 2021 um, all the way through, he was convicted in March of this year, a couple months ago, and he was convicted on all of the charges. The charges were two counts of civil disorder, two counts of obstruction, and one count of carrying a handgun on restricted grounds. And you might say, okay, well, wait a second. I thought you were talking about, about nonviolent fences. The interesting part of that fifth charge, that fifth count, is that that was not part of his original charging document. Prosecutors actually added that later based on the fact that he was wearing a holster that day. Um, they concluded that he also had a, a firearm. So what we're talking about here is really the two counts of civil disorder and the two counts of obstruction. He was convicted and of course he was convicted, right? Because everyone who is charged in Washington, D.C. is, especially a jury trial, is going to have a jury that's packed with Democrats because Washington, D.C., the vast majority of people who live in Washington, D.C. are Democrats. The vast majority of voters in Washington, D.C. are Democrats. So you you draw jurors from this jury pool in D.C. and you're going to have, you're not going to have a jury that has an equal number of conservatives or liberals. You're going to have a packed jury. It's going to be a jury with 
um, that, that are very sympathetic to radical leftist ideology and not just sympathetic, but people who probably work to advance radical leftist ideology on the Hill in Washington, D.C. That's why they live in Washington, D.C. This is one of the reasons, again, uh, not to go off on a tangent here, but this is one of the reasons why when people ask me all the time, are, are, are the deep staters ever going to be held accountable for their lawbreaking acti activity, whether it's Hillary Clinton and, you know, her server or the Russia collusion stuff, um, the Biden administration, Barack Obama, are, are, are any of these people going to be held accountable? I kind of say, I don't think so. Because even if we were to get to a point that they were charged, and we just saw this with Durham, right? Um, even if they were get they would get to a point where they were charged, and even if it, it it goes to a jury trial, the jury is going to be so biased to the left that they're not going to convict based on the politics of the thing instead of being neutral arbiters of the law like they're supposed to be. So, all that being said. Guy Wesley Reffitt was, was charged with these five counts. He was convicted on five counts and he is now facing sentencing. What is the sentence going to be for, for these counts? And this is where it gets really interesting. Now, two things that are really important to me online are safety and privacy. And that is why I like Incogni. Thousands of companies are collecting, aggregating, and then trading your personal data without you knowing anything about it. Well, the good news is, is you have the right to request data brokers to delete what information they have about you in order to protect your own privacy. The bad news is it would take you years to do it manually. The best news is Incogni can do the messy work for you automatically. Incogni helps you protect your privacy and take your personal data off the market by reaching out to data brokers on your behalf, requesting your personal data removal, and then dealing with their inevitable objections. Now, just to get an idea of what I'm talking about here, most often these data brokers hold your name, your email address, even if you think it's private, your home address, your personal phone number, sometimes even the names of your relatives, your social security number, your employment history, your shopping habits. Like I said, very, very creepy. You need Incogni. I love it, and I know you will too. The first 100 people to use my URL, it's incogni.com slash Liz, and use my promo code Liz, get 20% off Incogni. Protect your privacy today. Go to incogni.com slash Liz and use code Liz to take your personal data off the market. Today's video is sponsored by Incogni. Okay, so we're at the sentencing. We're at the point where Guy Wesley Ruffett is being sentenced and a, the Department of Justice submitted a document, a sentencing document that was 58 pages long, uh, their recommendations and request for sentencing. Now, this is Matthew Graves' You, it is the U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia. It is his office. And the U.S. prosecutor who, who it works for Matthew Graves, Matthew Graves is his boss, um, the one who submitted this sentencing document, his name is Jeffrey Nessler. Jeffrey Nessler works directly under uh, Matthew Graves. This is what Jeffrey Nessler wrote in this, this sentencing document. He wrote, the court should depart upward under USSG 3A1.4, terrorism, because Refit's conviction for obstructing Congress's certification of the Electoral College vote was, quote, calculated to influence or affect the conduct of government by intimidation or coercion. Okay, now that sounds pretty bad. So let's look at what he actually did. Let's look at what Guy Wesley Reffitt actually did. So he, he traveled to Washington, D.C. for January 6th. He traveled with one other person. Um, he actually never entered the Capitol building at all, ever. Not the entire day. He didn't enter it at all. Um, after he returned home several days later, he bragged about what he had done. He bragged about being part of the January 6th um, protests. He bragged about it to his son and his son captured that on video. And it's actually that video that prosecutors are using to accuse him of not being remorseful and not understanding uh, how serious the infraction that he committed was. And they're asking the court to sentence him to 15 years in prison on the basis that they say he played a central role in leading a mob that attacked the United States Capitol. Now, again, Guy Wesley Ruffett might have said things on video that were distasteful. He might have done things that um, are not advisable to do, but he never entered the Capitol building, ever. He didn't set one foot in the Capitol building. He did not attempt the kidnapping of a member of Congress. He did not attempt to seize any sort of government building or federal property. He brought no weapon of mass destruction, nor did he he plan to use one. He committed no, no arson, no vandalism, no destruction of federal property. He did not attempt to 
um, harm or kill a member of Congress. He didn't even plan to harm or kill a member of Congress. All of those elements are elements that that are are an element of a crime of terror, are elements of domestic terrorism. And he engaged in none of that. And yet Matthew Graves' office is asking for Guy Wesley Reffitt to be sentenced to 15 years in prison on the basis of committing a terror act, even though the guy didn't enter the Capitol. This is, this is what the document says. The terrorism enhancement is applicable where a defendant acts according to a plan, whether developed over a long period of time or developed in a span of seconds with the object of influencing government conduct or retaliating against a government. So let's break this down for a second. Um, first of all, influencing government conduct is our fundamental constitutional right. We are allowed to redress our, our, our gov- or petition our government for a redress of grievances. We're allowed to criticize government employees. We're certainly allowed to try to influence our members of Congress as they vote for things which impact us. Does that mean that you can, you can threaten violence or you can bribe or you can coerce, you can blackmail? No, of course not. But you can, and in fact, you should make your voice heard Um, in an attempt to influence the people in Congress who are there to represent you. So the idea that um, if you you engage in some kind of activity with the object of influencing government conduct, that that is a crime, that's actually really scary stuff. That's that's borderline, uh, not even borderline. If this were to be a conviction, this would be a blatant violation of our First Amendment um, rights to criticize our government. The other part of this this sentence that's really scary is um, where a defendant acts according to a plan, this document reads, whether developed over a long period of time or developed in a span of seconds. Developed in a span of seconds. What does that even mean? What what does that even mean? So if you're you're walking along and you have an idea for something and you you just turn to the right instead of turning to the left, that counts as the same as as, as conspiring to commit an act where you've planned for weeks and weeks? I don't think so. This, this, this is an attempt to turn January 6th defendants who, some of whom, yes, who, who broke the law, some of whom entered restricted grounds, some of whom entered the Capitol when they weren't supposed to, some of whom protested in, in, a, in an area where they were not allowed to do so. But it's an attempt to turn that nonviolent infraction into domestic terrorism. Now, if this sounds familiar, it's because the Department of Homeland Security tried to, it is familiar, the Department of Homeland Security has tried to label Trump-supporting parents who are against critical race theory and queer theory being indoctrinated into their children's minds in public schools, labeled them as domestic terrorists too. This is part of the Biden administration's larger agenda is to label you and I, anybody who questions the radical leftist ideology, anyone who tries to counter their political policies, um, anybody who speaks even words on social media that the left doesn't like as an actual, literal terrorist in the eyes of the law. They go on to say, the US, the US attorney for the District of Columbia, the, the prosecutor goes on to say, the crimes that Refit and others like him committed on January 6th are unprecedented. These crimes defy statutorily appropriate comparisons to other obstructive related conduct in other cases. To try to mechanically compare other defendants prior to January 6, 2021 would be a disservice to the magnitude of what the riot entailed and signified. Oh dear Lord, oh dear Lord, this is literally an admission from Jeffrey Jeffrey Nessler, the federal prosecutor who works for Matthew Graves, the US attorney for the District of Columbia, that this is all about politics. This is just politics. This is his political opinion that the magnitude of what the riot entailed and signified. What on God's green earth does that mean? Let's break that down. A disservice to the magnitude of what the riot entailed and signified. So in the eyes of the left, what the riot signified was Trump supporters' dissatisfaction with how election integrity was conducted. The electioneering of the 2020 presidential election that this, I mean, it's not even, it's not even uh, a question. It's not even an allegation. We know that the left electioneered. We know that the left um, that, that the left had universal mail-in ballots, had unattended drop boxes, degraded the quality of signature verification to make sure that there was no, there was no um, voter fraud. We know that these things happened and we know that in many states, I mean, the Wisconsin Supreme Court literally said these unattended drop boxes are against Wisconsin state law. And the people 
who in, in various states, not just Wisconsin, the people, the politicians or the bureaucrats in these states that, that, that conducted this electioneering had no authority to make these rule changes. The state legislatures have to do that and the state legislatures didn't. It was people who had no authority to make these changes and the changes were in violation of state law. This electioneering is unquestionable. It's not an allegation. It's, it's, it's not an opinion. It happened. It's reality. But according to the U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia, who is prosecuting these January 6th defendants, trying to turn them into domestic terrorism, the magnitude of what the riot signified makes comparisons to any other activity, any other action that would be the same action. You can't make that comparison, they say. These crimes defy statutorily appropriate comparisons. What he's saying is he doesn't want you to notice that while the U.S. attorney the, Bi the Biden Department of Justice really is, is, is prosecuting January 6th um, participants, trying to turn them into terrorists. He doesn't want you to notice that at the same time they're letting Stephen Colbert and his nine, his nine insurrectionists off that they dropped the charges. He doesn't want you to notice that while January 6th defendants have been in prison for a year and facing 15 year prison sentences, the protesters, the pro-abortion protesters outside of Brett Kavanaugh's home were breaking the literal same law. There, it is against the law to protest outside of a Supreme Court justice's home with the intent to, in, to influence the Supreme Court justice's opinion on a particular ruling. And those, those the, to use intimidation and coercion and threats of violence. And that's what those protesters are doing. And the Biden administration did not and had no intention of ever holding them to account, even though the law required that they do so. And so what, what the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Biden Department of Justice is saying is you can't compare that. You can't compare it because of, of what it meant to our country when January 6th happened. We're, we're not going to be a system of blind justice where Lady Justice weighs the circumstances against the law and decides whether the circumstances violated the law and if so, what the appropriate sentence should be. We're now going to add politics into the picture. We're going to say, well, if we feel that your action had a larger political ramification that offends us, we're going to sentence you like a terrorist. But if we feel that your action, if you are a member of Stephen Colbert's team, had political ramifications that we actually endorse and think is quite funny and cool, go about, go about your business. You're totally fine. High five, lib. To jail with you, conservative. This is the most terrifying sentencing document that I've seen in, in a long time. And one of the, one of the defense, the main, so the mainstream media and even, even, even elected Democrats, one of their defense one of their narratives that they are that they're propagating in defense of Stephen Colbert's um, nine insurrectionists is that they were entertainers. These aren't inherently political people. These aren't political protesters. They're just entertainers. And <laughs> no, 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 no. That is a lie. That is false. And their actions completely debunk that false narrative. So what what were Stephen Colbert's staff? What were they doing the day before in Washington D.C.? What were they doing the day before they were arrested? Well, they were harassing the family members and the attorneys for the family members of um, those who have been detained based uh, or detained after January 6th. Does that sound like something an entertainer does? Or does that sound like something a democratic activist does? Well, it sounds to me like something a democratic activist does. And they did this publicly during a press conference. Huh, and who do they work for? Who do they work for? They work for Stephen Colbert. Stephen Colbert is neither funny nor entertaining, but what he is is a shill for the Democratic Party. He's a shill for radical leftist talking points, which he pretends to present in a humorous way, but really it's not humorous. He's, he's, just, he's just a Democratic Party hack. And what were, what were Colbert's staffers doing while they were illegally in the restricted area without an escort inside the Capitol building? What were they doing? Well, they were actively attempting to harass Jim Jordan, they were actively attempting to harass Kevin McCarthy. They were actively attempting to harass Lauren Boebert by banging on the windows of their offices, banging on the doors. Um, does that sound like the behavior of an entertainer or does that sound like the behavior of a democratic activist? It sounds like the behavior of democratic activists, but it actually doesn't matter. 
you can be an entertainer if you want to be an entertainer or a democratic activist if you want to be a democratic activist. There is no exemption in the law, no entertainer exemption in the law for um, for for whether you are allowed in an, in the congressional office building with or without an escort, whether you are obstructing an official proceeding, whether you are um, whether you're in violation of being in a restricted area, the law simply doesn't care what your profession is. There is no such thing as an entertainer exemption in the law. The fact of the matter is the U.S. attorney, Matthew Graves, is a raging liberal. He is uh, sympathetic to exactly what Colbert was doing, which was trying to highlight the January 6th committee hearing in a positive way. The January 6th committee obviously is a very partisan body. They are, they have a, a very partisan objective. Congresswoman Liz Cheney actually has admitted that the goal of the January 6th committee is so that Trump, to make sure that Trump can't run again in 2024. She's advocating for him to be prosecuted and convicted for I don't know because he didn't commit a crime, but she wants to prosecute him and convict him anyway because if he's convicted, then he's not allowed to run again. This 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 agenda is supported by Stephen Colbert and supported by Stephen Colbert's staff and supported by the U.S. Attorney uh, Matthew Graves and his office and the federal prosecutors that works for him. This this is a miscarriage of justice. I mean, this this is like. This is what it's like to live in a banana republic where it's not just double standards, but you can be actively targeted based on your religious or your political beliefs. In fact, in fact, if we zoom out, this is, this is of course par for the course. This is, this is how Democrats act. They look for every opportunity that they can to weaponize the power of the federal government against us. But a really good example of the Democrats doing this, that this is not new behavior for them, that they've been looking for ways to weaponize the government against conservatives for a long time. And when they find those ways to weaponize the government, they, they take advantage of it. Dinesh D'Souza, is actually a perfect example of this same exact thing. Um, and Dinesh D'Souza, as you remember, was convicted for over-contribution to a campaign, which is against the law. Um, and it's not a right thing to do, which is why this is such a perfect example uh, compared to a lot of the January 6th defendants, because what they did, some of them were on restricted grounds. They shouldn't have been doing that, but it wasn't violent. So typically when, when there's a nonviolent infraction, especially of this kind, it, it, the charges are dropped. You're kind of just, you're kind of just, okay, don't do it again. Slap on the wrist, keep it going here. That's the same thing with over, over contributions to political campaigns. It's not good. It's not right. It technically is against the law. A lot of politicians and political operatives do it. And typically, it's just a slap on the wrist. Don't do it again. You know, go, you be on your way. But what happened to Dinesh D'Souza is he was convicted of a felony. He was sentenced to prison. And what's even worse than that is he was, he was essentially sentenced to a re-education camp. He was forced to undergo by the court mandatory psychological counseling because of over-contribution which if he wasn't conservative, he would have just received a slap on the wrist for. Uh, in fact, this was, this was part of the um, defense of his, of his attorneys at the, sentencing, at the sentencing hearing, as they said, and this is true, this is historically true, that no person in our country has ever been sentenced to any kind of time in prison um, relating to over-contribution to a campaign unless there was a quid pro quo attached to that over-contribution, unless there was some kind of additional corruption, basically selling of influence that happened. Nobody was has ever been sentenced in the way that Dinesh D'Souza was, but he was because he's conservative. And the scary part of all of this is Dinesh D'Souza um, is, is more famous than most of us. He not only had one of the highest highest powered defense attorneys in the land. He had an incredible platform. Everything he says is essentially reported on by the press. Um, and that still wasn't enough to protect him from being targeted by liberals in the federal government based on his political views, based on the fact that he was conservative, that he is conservative, and is therefore a threat to the radical leftist ideology that the liberals who run the federal government embrace. This is the same thing that's happening when we look at Stephen Colbert's nine, their charges dropped and January 6th defendants being subject to perhaps being sentenced on the basis of, of, of terrorism here. It is, it is untenable. It's mind blowing. And, and honestly, I'm not exactly sure how to end this episode. I mean, we, we see this and we all understand how horrible it is. We all understand that this is the Democrats uh, modus operandi. So I guess I'll just leave you with saying, <laughs> you know, watch your back. This, this shit's getting real out there. Democrats are deliberately targeting you based on your 
politics, based on your religion, based on your ideology, based on uh, whether or not you are a threat to their radical leftist Marxist ideology. And this is just another example of it. Um, join us on Locals, though. Over on the Liz Wheeler Show community on Locals, we're going to talk about something a little bit lighter, I think. Sesame Street, uh, Sesame Place, which is the Sesame Street theme park, is embroiled. They're actually being targeted by radical leftists. They're accused of being racist based on a video of uh, one of their costumes appearing to ignore two little black girls who wanted to give the costume a hug. But that video doesn't show everything, doesn't show the full reality of it. So we're going to break it down and talk about what exactly is going on there and what the leftists are trying to do to Sesame Street. Join us, lizwheelershow.com slash locals. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. I'm Liz Wheeler. This is The Liz Wheeler Show. The Liz Wheeler Show is produced by Jonathan Hay. Executive producer, Chad Abbott. Director of photography, Kevin McRoberts. Editor, Alejandro Figuerilla. Sound mixer, Robin Fenderson. Director of marketing, Emily Washler. Production and talent coordinator, Matt Toffler. And senior publicist, Patricia Jackson. This has been a Soundfront production. If you haven't already, give this video a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button below, and ring the bell to make sure you never miss a video.